Hello, folks. Yeah, Bazers is doing the show with us. Yeah, she decided Beijing. she was going to come settle in, uh, in my lap while we were recording. Yeah, <laughs> Which, spoiled. Uh, well, you She's know. spoiled. Yeah, she is very spoiled. Yeah. So maybe you'll be able to hear her purring. I'm not really sure. Yeah. But so on this installment of the movie retrospective, we are finally, finally getting around to one of my very favorite movies of the 1980s one of my very favorite horror comedies that is for goddamn sure and i can't believe it's taken us this long to get to it this is 1985's fright night yeah i hadn't seen this movie in a long time oh, i fucking love this movie. it was a lot so better much. it was a lot better than i remembered it <laughs> it's a lot better than i remembered it and it had a lot of character development in the characters the themes were a lot deeper than than i remember the writing was good man writing was good from this era oh yeah yeah well the cool thing about this one now this was the directorial debut of tom holland uh he would go on to do child's play and many other things uh prior to this he had been an actor and then he had been a screenwriter uh, matter of fact he wrote the screenplay for psycho 2 which was actually way fucking better than it had any right to be uh, he also had written the screenplay for Class of 1984. Now, when he was getting into doing this, and the one thing, one of the best things about this movie, among its many amazing qualities, <laughs> what? Yeah, it's just, it's <laughs> is that you can tell that everyone involved, particularly Tom Holland, was like super, super into this project because there's just such, there's such an affection for the genre like on display, like, and from everyone involved that they really, really wanted to make this the best possible movie that they could make it. And it really, really kind of like shines through and like how sweet and fun, like an homage this is. Because the thing about Fright Night is that, so Tom Holland got the idea. He's like, I was just thinking about, um, you know, just, just a thing about a high school kid or a college kid whose neighbor is a vampire and nobody believes him. And he's like, and I thought that would make a really funny premise for a movie. Now, it should be noted that when this came out in 1985, I mean, horror movies, I mean, slashers were like a big thing. And so they even kind of comment on that, like inside Fright Night, where there's no, oh, teenagers don't want to see vampires anymore. You know, they want to see teenagers getting, you know, or what do you say, like have, hacking up young virgins or something like that. Someone in a ski mask hacking up young virgins. So the interesting thing about this, though, is that, so it's kind of like a meta uh, you know, just kind of a meta thing, like on the on the genre as a whole, the vampire genre, like that old school, like hammer horror type of thing, like horror hosts and stuff, which in 1985 was kind of pretty much going out of fashion. Um, yeah, it was kind of a throwback for its day. Yeah, but it's like so it was kind of like a love letter to that. Yeah. But interestingly, when it came out and did so well and got and got like a lot of critical praise and it like made a lot more money than they were expecting. Um, it actually kind of kick-started, like, it almost made vampires cool again. You know what I mean? Because, like, you know, then Near Dark came out, Lost Boys <coughs> came out, and it, it's almost like it reinvigorated the vampire genre, like, for a new generation, I guess. Because at that point, like I said, Hammer Horror was, in the 80s, that was, like, kind of creaky old, like, 60s horror, you know what I mean? And it was kind of cheesy, and it was going out of fashion a little bit. I remember at the time, the way the movie felt in terms of tone was kind of like a cross between... Salem's Lot and kind of like uh, a teenage kind of adventure movie is the way it felt at the time. But revisiting it again, there's a lot of adult themes in it. Yeah. The undertones and stuff. It, there's some, there, there's like three tiers to it. There's young guys, like 13, 14, 15 year olds. And then guys in their late teens, 18, 19. And then there's old, there's an old guy story. Yeah. So it's kind of like, showing three different groups of guys at different developmental stages yeah well there's also the adults too so i guess you could say four yeah yeah you know what i mean like the married people yeah and the vampire in a, in a certain way it, it kind of <laughs> came off as kind of like but it just kind of showed guys at different levels of develop of development yeah the whole thing did you, know, did you notice that thing yeah yeah well the cool thing about it like i said you know th when Tom Holland wrote the screenplay, basically it was just like, you know, what if your next door neighbor was a vampire and you had to kill him and like you saw him killing people, but no one would believe you. And he thought that would be like a really funny, um, you know, for a horror comedy, like a very funny topic. And like I said, he wanted to homage, um, you know, your kind of horror hosts, you know, like Sven Gulli and, you know, Zachary and Elvira and all that kind of stuff, um, because that was kind of going out of fashion. So with that, he wrote the character of, because at first he just had 
the kid. He had Charlie Brewster was like his main character. And he's like, I didn't know if I could make a whole movie out of that. But then he thought, well, here's this kid who's super obsessed with old horror movies. And he discovers that his next door neighbor is a vampire. Well, who would I go to if I was a teenager and was I would go to the horror host, the guy that was in all the movies, the vampire killer. Mm. So then he's like, so then I decided to write that character into it. And from then the movie just kind of wrote itself. Yeah. So he's even been quoted as saying that Charlie Brewster, um, you know, the kid in this, who's supposed to be 17 or 18 years old, he's still in high school. Uh, he's played by William Ragsdale in the movie that he was like the, the engine that got the plot going, but that Peter Vincent played by Roddy McDowell, who was fucking brilliant in this, um, that he was like the heart of the movie, which he really is because he has like the biggest character arc. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because at the beginning, he's just, you know, he's he's on this like crappy TV horror host. He's on late at night. It's like he's showing all these old cheesy ass movies that he was in like when he was much younger. Um, he's actually much younger in he was much younger in real life than he looks in this movie. They yeah. made him look much older. Yeah, they got his hair grayed out. In yeah, the, they got his hair grayed and like makeup the, on and stuff. In the HD versions of the movie, you could see it. But you, you couldn't see it in the VHS. Yeah. You know what I mean? You couldn't see that it was fake white paint in the hair. Yeah. But it's pretty obvious in HD. Yeah, because like I said, they wanted him to play like an old, washed up, yeah. like horror actor who wasn't even that good back in his day. He yeah. was just like in this cheesy like... Ha like ha hammer knockoff shit right and then he's just like at this fucking little local station like showing all these old movies in the middle of the night yeah and the theme there i'll tell you it wasn't real obvious to me at the time and it wasn't really spelled out in the movie but you got this old british actor who's at the end of his career and he in the movies, he plays this bad, this like real brave uh, Van Helsing style vampire killer. But in real life, he's kind of this old British queen and a coward, you know. And he yeah. didn't believe in any vampires. But there was a lot of character development in it, you know. After he realized that or was convinced that vampires did exist, he becomes the man that he pretended to be, you know, a real heroic figure. And it's not really spelled out that way. It, well, I guess it is. The movie wasn't promoted with that angle. You have to see it to see what it is you're talking about. Nowadays, they probably would have made that the central focus of the movie, but they didn't make a big deal out of it back then. Just dude became the, the man that he always wanted to be. He well, became self-actualized. Even though, interestingly, when Tom Holland wrote the screenplay, I mean, he obviously wrote uh, the character of Peter Vincent uh, that was based on Peter Cushing and Vincent Price. And actually, he wanted Vincent Price for the role. Um, but I've heard two stories. There's either, like, Vincent Price was like, I don't really want to do horror anymore, or he was too sick to, you know, he, he was his health was too poor. Yeah, to, I could like, tell it was movie. a Vincent Price. Thing, but yeah. when uh, Roddy McDowell got the role, yeah. he said that he modeled his performance after... Bert Lahr, the cowardly lion in The yeah. Wizard of Oz. He's like, that's what I wanted. His, that's what I wanted his like uh, character arc to be like. That's what I wanted him to act like because he is like a super super hammy like over the top act. He's not even British. He's just like kind of like affecting that. He's pretending to be British. Yeah, like, okay. that's what I mean. So he okay. was kind of like because you could. I mean, he's obviously not. You know. So I mean, okay. so that you know. They, I thought the I thought the actor was supposed to be British. Well, he just like put on that affectation. I gotcha. Like I said, because you know how a lot of like those. He was an actor. He was one of those old school like actors. Trying you know, to be like a Shakespearean. A theory, except actor. like I said, he knew he wasn't any good, and okay. he's even said that in interviews that he's like he's supposed to be like a washed up shitty actor from All back right. in the old days who thought he was awesome. Okay. And then now he's like super, I got you know, and now he's like at this shitty fucking TV, sta yeah. TV station. All right. That makes, that adds another dimension yeah. to it that I didn't know. I thought he was actually supposed to be a British character. No, he was, he was, he was a washed up American actor pretending to be British. Yeah. He was just trying to be, yeah, <laughs> okay. it was like that. All right. That, that, that makes it even more. That's what I mean. That's what's so fucking great about the, this uh. movie. You guys, if you haven't seen this, seriously, this is easily, easily one of the best, yeah. one, of, if not the best horror comedies of the 80s. Um, it's just, like I said, it's just such an affectionate homage to that genre. And um, so the whole premise of the story, like I said, uh, you know, Charlie Brewster is this kid. He lives with his single mom. 
Um, he's got a girlfriend who's played by Amanda Burse, uh, who obviously became famous later on for being uh, the neighbor on Married with Children, Marcy Darcy. Uh, she was actually 27 in this, even though she was supposed to be a high school kid. <laughs> but she still pulled it off, I thought. William Ragsdale was 24, I looked it up. Because we, we were saying oh, all these all these movies with like all these kids playing high school students, and they were all in their yeah. 20s. They were. But, um, so he's got this girlfriend, and her name is Amy. And they, they, this made us laugh, and this made Tom laugh. But they've been going out for a year, and uh, Amy still has not put out. Yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I called bullshit on that immediately when I saw it. I, I said, "No, I was, I've been to high school at least once. <laughs> Didn't go down that way." Well, I don't think it would go oh. down that way nowadays either. It's yeah, like, a week was an eternity. You could still get away with that, like maybe in the eighties. Hey, why are you holding out on me? <laughs> Why are you holding out on me? It's been two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's like, yeah. In a way, like I, I get where she was coming from because she was like she wasn't sure about it and she was like kind of scared. She was a virgin and all this other kind of stuff. And yeah. he was actually pretty understanding about it, although he was, you know, understandably getting frustrated. So finally, they're at the house one night, like making out upstairs while mom is downstairs. And she's finally like, okay, we're we're going on with the we're going ahead with the sex. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. And then he gets distracted by okay, two guys okay. out yeah. in the yard carrying a coffin into the neighbor's house. Mm-hmm. Like someone's moving into the house next door. And he's like, there's two guys out of the coffin. And he's like, and then she's like, so, and then he just like completely ignores her. She's sitting there with her bra and everything like that. She's yeah. like, all right, fuck you, buddy. Yeah. I'm taking off. <laughs> so they're like having this fight through the whole thing. So, now, at first, like I said, because Charlie is just kind of, like, obsessed with horror movies, especially old horror movies, like Peter Benson is his hero, and he loves, like, all these old, uh, you know, these old movies. So, he just thinks it's kind of weird and stuff, so he kind of starts spying on the guy next door, especially after the next day when they get a fucking, uh, when a call girl shows up at the house next door, and she's like, oh, is this, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna go over here, and he's like, all right. Yeah. So, all right. So Charlie's looking uh, out the window that night because he see he saw the call call girl go in there, and he's hoping to see some action. Um, what, pro tip to vampires out there, though: uh, if you don't want to get caught for serial murder, close your shades, man, because yeah. like your neighbors are like watching you through the binoculars. So he's looking at the window through the binoculars, and he's got like his snacks and like you know some porn magazines on the ground and stuff like that. And he sees his neighbor, this suave motherfucker named Jerry Dandridge, who's played by Chris Sarandon. He actually sees little fangs come out and he's got like big long nails and stuff. And it looks like he's going to bite this one in the neck. Then later on, he notices that someone is bringing a body or what appears to be a body wrapped in black plastic uh, out and puts it into the back of a car. Now, he thinks it's weird But he doesn't really, like, get super serious about it until the next day when he's at school. Because then he sees, like, a news report that the call girl, there's a picture of her on the news. And it's, like, that she was found, I think she was found, like, beheaded or something like that. So he starts to freak out and say, okay, well, the neighbor's a vampire. He's obviously killing people. And so he tries to tell Amy and his best friend, who's played by Stephen Jeffries, Evil Ed, uh, who's like another big horror nerd and who was really great in this. He's like super funny. And um, so he tries to tell them, obviously they don't believe him, but he's like, look, I did see that girl over there. It's like, I'm not going to tell the cops he's a vampire. I'll just tell them that I saw that girl over there and they got to investigate. So the police come over to the house and there's like this whole thing that happens. Now it ha- it happens too that J- uh, Jerry Dandridge's character, who is the vampire, he also has a quote unquote roommate named Billy Cole, who I guess he's, he, that's like his daytime protector. He's not human either, though. No, he's like a thrall. Yeah, I think that's probably what it is. Because I see a lot of people going, oh, well, he's not a vampire because he walks around in the daytime. No, he's like a Renfield, like you know, like uh, Mr. Barlow's uh, thrall. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Like, he's he can do human shit, but he's not kind of. I, th- I think it's Anne Rice influence type stuff where, you know what I mean? You, dude wants to become a vampire. So he starts to become the servant of a vampire. He gets some blood, you know, he, he gets some powers. But in the end, that vampire is not going to turn him into a vampire. He's just using him. Yeah. Using him as a slave, basically. Yeah. Thrall, that happens in a lot of vampire That's stories. That's what I'm saying, because they yeah. need somebody to, like, watch over him during the daytime so people yeah. just don't bust in the house it comes and, like, from Renfield. take them and shit. That started yeah. with Renfield. 
Yeah. He had some vampire blood in him, but he yeah, was because a, he didn't turn him into a full vampire. No. He was just kind of like his little. They're disposable. His little helper. Yeah. Yeah, they're disposable slaves, really. Yeah. So it so it so happens that uh, the cops come. They obviously like interview Billy Cole, and he's just like, "Oh, what? We just you know, I don't know what you're talking about." And the cops, and then like Charlie like flips out and starts telling the cops, "Oh, you have to go down to the basement. They have coffins down there, and Jerry Dandridge is a vampire." So obviously the cops are like, "Yeah, fuck off, kid," and they don't believe him. So then he decides that he is going to go contact Peter Vincent, the great vampire killer, who is on TV. And who is in all these old movies. Yeah. And obviously, and it so happens that the day he goes to the studio to, like, talk to Peter Vincent is the same day he's been fired from the show, his, uh, like, you know, late night show, which is called Fright Night, uh, because young people don't want to see vampire movies anymore, especially the kind that he used to do. Yeah. So yeah. when this what, character shows up, I mean, yeah, I, I think the story gets interesting when when this character shows up. Really, Roddy McDowell brings a lot to this movie, and he loved um, this role. Yeah, I mean, he really, really the role, was into the it. role. I interpret, I interpreted the role as that he's a gay character, and I, I, the, I remembered kind of like a bunch of gay undertones with the movie too, even between the vampire and his thrall. There were a lot of people have pointed that out because later on, you know, I don't want, we don't want to spend tell the whole story, spoil the whole movie. Later on, the vampire betrays that thrall, really. That that thrall rises to the occasion willing to give his life for his for his vampire. I, I it looked like to me like some, you know, trisexual shit going on, you know what I mean? They were bringing women in in the triads and they were just <laughs> trying shit out, you know what I mean? These you got a vampire, his wannabe lo- vampire lover, and then these hookers that they're killing and drinking. Yeah. But it looked like love triangle shit to me. It did, and, kind of. The only yeah. really direct reference they make to that is where, when Jerry Dandridge and the, what they called the live-in carpenter, uh, when they first move in next door, Charlie's mom is, like, looking out the window, like, talking about how handsome Jerry Dandridge is. Yeah. And then she says, oh, but he's got a live-in carpenter over there. With my luck, he's probably gay. Yeah. Because she's single and on the make, man. And then, but he comes over and, like, she's yeah. all, you know, he's laying and, the charm on. And, and Vincent is, he just comes off as a, as a queen to me. A, 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 an actor, you know, um, cowardly, uh, but still a good guy. And the theme throughout the whole movie... It's not stated ex- explicitly, but this is how I interpret it. Throughout the movie, you got the teenage guy trying to save his teenage girlfriend, but in many ways, Vincent is trying to save the young guy from yeah. being killed by, by these vampires. And it, it all works out good, and he, you know, he, he ends up being a hero. And that's just, that was the theme that, that I picked up from it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, I may be wrong, but it's hard to... Roddy McDowell doing this part, he just comes across as a gay actor. Yeah. I mean, he's not married. He's an older guy. Ne- nothing's ever brought up about his sexuality or having a wife or anything, but he's definitely defending people. Yeah. And it, and he never makes a move on the kid. It's just that, you know what I mean? You could tell that he was very protective of, of everybody, really. And it just comes across as, to me, as a, as a gay character. Yeah. Just in the eighties they be, would, but like I said, it could go either way. I the, think in the eighties they wouldn't spell it out. They'd leave yeah. it up to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's that's how I interpret it. I mean, most like I said, most people that talk about um because a lot of people have talked about this movie having a gay subtext, which a lot of movies in the eighties did actually. So I'm not the only one who saw it. Um not not so much with Vincent's character, but more with the vampire and like I said, and his buddy. Like well, the you know, that was kind of we, like a more We got a we got a lot of gay subscribers. If you're gay, look, watch that movie and you get back with me. You you tell me is that guy gay and I'm, yeah. I'm i'm telling you that that sounds like an 80s gay character the way that character was written maybe so yeah. back in the 80s they didn't they didn't push that to the forefront they let you see it if you wanted to and yeah that's just that's how i interpret it well and like i said i think that one you can tell because roddy mcdowell really really wanted this part and he really really loved playing this character um, and that really comes across. Yeah. He is, like you said, probably the most interesting character yeah. in the movie because he has the largest arc. He's very funny yeah. at the beginning. Like I said, he comes across very much like the Cowardly Lion. Yeah. Um, because he's an actor, he's the vampire killer in movies. So he's like very up himself. He's very full of himself. But when like dangerous shit really starts to happen, his first instinct is to like run and hide. He doesn't want anything to do yeah. with it. Um, you know what I mean? Because at first he doesn't believe 
Charlie that the guy's a vampire. You know, he tells the kid to fuck off. Finally, um, you know, Amy and Evil Ed, like, come to him and he's just like, no, that kid's crazy. It's like, there's no such thing as vampires. And they're like, look, you really have to help him out. He's going to kill the guy next door, um, you know, while he's sleeping if you don't do something. And finally, they offer to pay him. They're going to give him, like, $500 if yeah. he will come and perform a quote-unquote vampire test on Jerry Dandridge in yeah. front of Charlie so that Charlie will, you know, yeah. will be convinced that he is not a vampire. Yeah, and then the way the story ends, you got a guy who is a fake, basically, an, an actor. Yeah. Okay, a fake vampire killer who's cowardly. He's he's queenly, kind of effeminate, you know what I mean? He's gay. He, he, He's not a success, and he's losing his job. He's not a success. That character mo- moves into a gay hero, really. That's how I interpreted it. Yeah. He was still gay, but no, he really was a vampire killer. He killed a bunch of them in the movie. How yeah. many vampires did he actually kill, inclu- including the, the Thrall? Maybe four? Well, no, because, well, he killed... Um, I think you could probably count two, three. Two, three, four. Yeah. Two and then well because they kind of him and Charlie both kind of uh, got together and killed because they're the only weren't other, some people that turned into vampires no just evil Ed just just evil Ed okay and he killed that was oh my god so we have he, to talk too about so he killed a vamp two vampires and a thrall yeah so the, so he so he killed multiple although men. Charlie killed the thrall I think because he remember he shot him a bunch of times and it didn't do anything okay. like he got but back he was up. in on it that and was then, the first, yeah 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 that was the first one that they killed and that's really where uh, cuz they yeah Vincent started to get confidence that you can fight yeah. vampire type things yeah so that's that was the first part of his cuz at first transition. they said, remember they at first they thought Billy Cole was just a guy right so he's so he brought a gun and he's like well right. we can just shoot him he's just a dude but then right. he got back well up. by the end of his, <laughs> by the end of Vincent's story arc He's a successful hero, and he gets his show back. Yeah. So, so he actually becomes the man he he wanted to be. Yeah. Which I thought that was awesome. The one he, the, yeah, the one he always played in the, the movie. One, the ones that he always played in the movie. That's what he really became. Yeah. And the the lesson was the my interpretation, having coming up in the eighties, the subtext in the writing is that a gay man could be a hero. That's yeah. how I interpreted it. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, it's it you know it it could be interpreted that way. You could also interpret it like in a more kind of universal way, where it's just like you know, like I said, he was just like a cowardly character, and he just like I was looking at it from the '80s Hollywood perspective. Yeah. There were a lot of gay people in Hollywood at that time, and that was the story that I believe that they were showing. Yeah, that you know what I mean. I have to say too that um, the special effects in this are amazing. Uh, particularly the special effect where Evil Ed, after he gets turned into a vampire and he, like, attacks Peter Vincent in a wolf form, and then Peter Vincent ends up, like, uh, staking him with, like, a sharp, like, a table leg, and he kind of, like, turns back into Evil Ed as he's dying, and it's, like, not only a really awesome, like, special effect scene, but it's also, like, a really affecting scene, because Peter Vincent, you can tell that he feels really, really bad that he had to kill this little kid, you know, he's, well, he's not a little kid, but he's, like, a teenager, you know, because he turned into a vampire. And, you know, just like cool, like the wolf transformation, like as he's going back into the, you know, person and stuff like that is really cool. Also, I want to say too that when Amy gets vampified, um, she is almost unrecognizable, like when they did. Because, you yeah. know, they tried to make her look very good girl. She had like the shorter hair. And yeah. It's like she, a little bit boyish, kind of. And uh, she wasn't very attractive, actually. Yeah. She was attractive as a vampire, but not That's not what as I mean. Team, it was yeah. like a huge upgrade. Yeah. So so yeah. like when she got vampified by Jerry, because she got kidnapped by him for a while and you know, he bit her and stuff, and she comes out in like this Marilyn Monroe looking dress. She's got this long, like red, wild hair, and she had yeah. this better makeup. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, the best scene, and this scene used to like kind of freak me out when I was younger, is when um, you know, when she's kind of turns her uh, face away from Charlie and she's like, you said he wasn't good. You wouldn't let him get me. And then she turns around and she has that huge fucking mouth with like yeah. all this fucking teeth in it. Like and a shit frog like that. mouth with a bunch of teeth in it. Yeah. It almost like, it looked like a big like snake face or something yeah. like that. It was just like really, really cool. Yeah. Um, I have to say too, that a lot of the um, effects work, I was, re- there's a really good, it's not, it was on shutter. It's not on there anymore. But there was a three and a half hour, three and a half hour documentary about the making of Fright Night. And it was called You're So Cool, Brewster, 
uh, which if you've seen the movie, you'll know why it's called that. And they went into like exhaustive detail about like the making of it and all the special effects and everything like that. And it's just, you know, they were talking about the, the fucking contact lenses, which, you know, now contact lenses, they're just like that thin plastic and it's like super easy and stuff. But back then they were made of like, they were really thick glass and they had to like buff them and like get all the shit out of there. And uh, they had some problems with, you can only wear them for 20 minutes at a time. And then they had to take them out because you couldn't see through them. You know, like those big like yeah. yellow fucking things that they wore. But yeah, so special effects, amazing. Um, I love the evil Ed character. I've seen this movie probably a million times. I used to have it on VHS back in the uh, late 80s. And uh, it's it's just super fun. It's, you know, there's like some 80s cheese, like with the nightclub scene and stuff like that. But it ha- it actually has some great songs in it too. Like they had one by yeah. Sparks. Uh, the Jay Giles Band did the uh, yeah. theme song, like the, the title song and stuff like that. Now, here's something that was really interesting. I had completely forgotten that they made a Fright Night Part 2. It came out in 1988. Oh, yeah, I didn't remember that. And I was thinking to myself, it's like, okay, I know I must have seen this at some point. But, so I found it on YouTube, like kind of a shitty, like old VHS copy, like pan and scan. Any good? Um, it's actually not bad. Oh, uh, should watch it then. The only... Um, the only recurring cast, they got William Ragsdale back uh, mm-hmm. as Charlie, and they got um, Rodney McDowell back as okay. Peter Vincent. Oh, okay, yeah. Like but it. um, it's actually like, because I'm watching it, and I was like, I probably saw this because every now and then, like, I'd see a scene or, like, a line read or something. I'm like, that seems familiar. So I must have seen this, but I didn't remember anything about it. So I must have seen it, like, one time. Was the writing as good? Um, it was a different writer and a different director. Um, Tom Holland was like on set and like he did like consult on the script and stuff like that. It's not, I mean, it's a similar, pretty similar storyline. It's like what you get is, you know, uh, Charlie's in college now. He has a different girlfriend because, uh, Amanda Burst didn't want to come back for the second one. Um, so, and, uh, and, and it's like, you know, he's in college, he's in a dorm and then basically there's a vampire named Regine and she is, you know, they reveal later on that she is the sister of Jerry Dandridge and she's kind of come looking for them because uh, revenge. And she kind of has like a whole little vampire posse. Mm-hmm. Now, an interesting angle that they did for the sequel too was that at the beginning, Charlie has been in therapy and he has convinced himself that vampires aren't real. Oh, so they got to go through that. And that, yeah, and that the whole thing, like with Jerry Dandridge and everything, he's like, oh, well, Jerry Dandridge was just a regular old serial killer, and I imagined that he was a vampire and stuff. But Peter Vincent still believes. Right. So there's kind of like a conflict there where, you know. Trying to get him to remember what Like, yeah, where Charlie, like, goes back to see him, and he's just, you know. Well, the first version, the writing is top notch. It is, yeah. You got the, you got the, uh, the normal, you got the very superficial story that happens, and then there's all these subtexts that are there. Or maybe they're not there, but that's a sign of good writing to me. They, they, they let you decide what it is that you see outside that normal story arc. Which, I, you know what I mean? Like all the subtexts we're, we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, to me, that's always a, a sign of good writing. You know what I mean? Oh, definitely. To where you see the story, you watch the story, you enjoy it, but then you go, wait a minute, was this going on? Was this actually happening? Yeah. But the different levels of it. Yeah, you, you can know? read different things into it. That's right. always like really good. Like, like really the scene, this, like the death scene between Evil Ed and Vincent is there, and the way Vincent's interaction with this, you know, dying vampire. What are we seeing there? You know what I mean? Because you know, there's a lot of a lot of emotion going on. Yeah. You know, um, are we just seeing normal compassion, or are we seeing a gay subtext? We don't know. Yeah. It's it's but. That's that's what made the movie cool. It's on you to interpret it. Yeah. And like I said, I think it's it's important to note too that like, you know, Tom Holland, he, you know, he started as an actor and then he went into screenwriting and he like is actually like has written like a lot of really good movies, particularly in the horror genre. So he knew what he was doing with this right. shit. Like he's come at it from an actor's point of view, he comes at it from a writer's point of view. Like I said, this was the first movie that he directed and that's kind of amazing because yeah. this movie yeah. is, I mean, it's a cult classic. Yeah, not only are they telling you the stories, not, not only are all these subtexts, there's also a morality tales yeah. happening between all this stuff. And I like that kind of shit. I, I like things that are very close to, you know, mythology. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Star Wars level type. Or, you know, we're talking about, 
you know, the, the original Star Wars movie level, yeah. you know, uh, uh, mythologies, you know, which is good stories with, you know, symbolism and stuff and morality tales. I, I'm into that. Yeah. And this is one of, this is a movie that is like that. Well, and plus this movie is just fun. And yeah, like a I lot said, of fun, it's, yeah. it's just a fun movie. Yeah. It's got like funny moments. It's got yeah. scary moments. There's good special effects and stuff. Yeah. You can drink during this movie. Yeah, you, it's just like, it's not, just super, super fun. Yeah, if you, you can pay attention to it and see all these themes and all these lessons, and you, but you don't have to fuck, you don't have to take it that seriously. Yeah. But the tone of the movie is kind of playful. Yeah. So, you know, I like that. But even though, like I said, it's still got creepy kind of shit yeah. going on, but... You know, the character of Jerry Dandridge is very, very good. Chris Sarandon yeah. plays a great fucking vampire. Even though he was initially reluctant because he's like, oh, I don't really want to do another horror movie. Even though he went on to do Child's Play with Tom Holland as well. Yeah. Um, but you know what I mean? So it's just all the characters are good. They all work together really good. Yeah. Um, another thing, too, that I wanted to mention, and maybe the reason why this works so well and why all the characters interacted so well with one another, was that Tom Holland had the whole movie pretty much storyboarded out, like scene for scene. And he gave the, all the actors two weeks, and they worked the whole movie through like a stage play, like over and over and yeah, over you again. Yeah, can, okay, I can I can feel it in the movie. Yeah. I can see that in the movie. They did it like That's a play. That's why the movie has such a good flow to it. Yeah, and they, um, because these characters had been interacting yeah. with each other. They a, all had their own backstories that they made up about the characters. And a lot like happens that. in this movie. I forgot how much actually happens in the movie. It is, it, and it it's moves, really, really well paced. Yeah. It moves along quickly, and a lot of shit happens uh, for the story to unfold. And there's a lot there without it being messy or tedious. It's 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 a good movie. It's a lot better than I remembered it. It just goes to show you how good the storytelling was of the eighties. It wasn't all good. Yeah. There was some yeah, there was, shit. There was man. a lot of shit in the eighties. But the dudes that <laughs> dudes that knew their shit back in the eighties could tell you a badass story. Yeah. And uh, and no matter what what who you were, what your politics were, you could enjoy that story. And understand that message, and under you know they were just real good at it. Oh yeah, and like I said, yeah. one of the best things, and one of the things that keeps me coming back to this movie is that you can tell that Tom Holland, who wrote it, he was really, really, he really loved old school horror. He loved yeah. all those cheesy Hammer movies. He loved yeah. like all this old, old horror hosts and stuff. So he's like having fun with that, but he's not making fun of it. There's no. like, you know what I mean? There's It's very affectionate kinda using a homage. Kind of using a similar template or a tonal template. Well, not, eh. you just have to see it. To, you have to see it draw your own conclusions. I, I think it's a, a high quality movie. I'd it like, is, like I'd I like said. To, I'd like to see the sequel now. Now I didn't know that there was one. It's, um, yeah, I watched it a couple hours ago, like before we recorded this. Um, it's actually not bad. I had seen it back in the 80s because I did remember a couple of scenes, but it hadn't made an, an well, impression we'll, the same way. That, we'll wait a few weeks. You've already seen it all, all Well, I was, I was only paying attention to like the first half because I was oh, doing okay. some other shit, so we can watch I it later. I want to see it in high quality. If I'm going to see it, I'm, you know, I'll rent it. Yeah, you should probably rent it. But uh, I'll tell you what, Fright Night will be in my Blu-ray collection. I will eventually buy this one. Yeah, because like I said, I had this on VHS. I've probably seen it at least 50 times, if we not more. We also, re right after this, we watched uh, Lost Boys. I, and uh, that one I also want to own. I forgot how good that movie That'll was. That'll probably be the next review, I'm yeah, probably imagining. Because, so, yeah, sneak we're... peek. Uh, Lost Boys. <laughs> oh, and I have to mention, too, um, I haven't seen it, but in 2011, there was a remake of Fright Night. Um, I kind of want to see it, even though I read the Wikipedia plot synopsis. It's similar, but they did a couple different things with it. Um, David Tennant actually plays the uh, Peter Vincent character. Okay. And he is not an old school horror host because they thought that modern audiences wouldn't connect as much with that. Because, Little you know, do they know. Yeah, well, I know. But it's like, so they thought horror that conventions. that wouldn't work. Boy, those don't yeah. exist. Yeah. They thought that wouldn't work. So they made him like a Chris Angel type, uh, like Vegas, like a washed up Vegas magician okay. uh, who also happened to be a vampire expert for whatever reason. Um, Colin Farrell uh, plays the Jerry Dandridge character. It has like a lot of good actors in it uh anton yelchin who passed away you know he was in the star trek movies and stuff like that uh that younger kid he played the charlie brewster character we'll see it um but i i've heard that i i think the people that were in the original movie like they, they got asked about it at like a horror convention and some of them said yeah it was all right but it wasn't really in the same spirit um and, and a particularly Stephen Jeffries, who played Evil Ed in the original one, he thought, well, I didn't really like the Evil Ed character in the new one because he seemed a little mean-spirited. Whereas in the original movie, he was just kind of a goofball. Yeah. And I think in the remake, too, they made it like 
Charlie and Evil Ed weren't friends anymore because Charlie had like started hanging out with like a cooler crowd and like Evil Ed was like super dorky and he didn't want to hang out with them anymore. So they had that kind of thing going on, um, which wasn't in the original. I mean, in the original, Charlie wasn't really a dork. He was just kind of like a regular dude. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, you know, Evil Ed was kind of dorky, but lovably dorky. You know what I'm saying? I thought he was annoying. He's a little bit annoying, yeah. Annoying. But, you know, he was better as a vampire. True. Yeah, he, 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 he was a scary... <laughs> well, he was a freaky vampire. Yeah, with that hair sticking yeah, up yeah. and everything like that. And, it's and, funny yeah. because he actually wanted, when he went to um, to read for the part, he actually wanted the Charlie Brewster role. But then they called yeah. it back and said, no, we want you to be Evil Ed, and he was kind of bummed out about yeah. that. <laughs> and that's it. And he, wouldn't, he didn't want to do the sequel, even though he died in the first one, but... Um, you know, they thought they could bring him back oh, somehow, uh, but what? Oh, I just forgot to mention that the practical effects in this are really strong. Yeah, I, mean, I said that before. Did yeah, you? Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 they're very good. Um, there was just something about CG that could ruin this movie. The, uh, the the tone of the movie and the time, the setting and everything, just when the movie yeah. was made. I it, heard the CG ho- in the remake was not it, good. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't have CG at this time because they would have used it and it would have fucking ruined it. And it, it. would have been terrible. Um, yeah, because the way they worked with the practical effects, it, it kept the, the movie tonally was consistent throughout the whole thing. And it's a masterpiece of what... The, this movie's a masterpiece of what it is. Yeah. You know, it's not... You're not talking about The Shining or anything like that. It's just... It's a Saturday night movie. Yeah, it's a know? fun and horror comedy. F- right, and it's it, it's doing its job really well, and it stood up the test. It stood the test of time. If you ask me, in my humble opinion, fifty years of fucking excellence. I'm telling you, in my opinion, <laughs> the movie the movie the movie hold, st- holds up. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant yeah, yeah. movie, and like yeah. I said, it's not only like kind of scary. It's funny, yeah. and it also has like a really really good heart to it, which a lot it's, of horror movies don't have. It was that time. When Spielberg was still doing good shit, he still does stu- good stuff. But there, mm-hmm. '80s, there's something about '80s Spielberg. There's something about that '80s middle class America setting where you have this fucking tone, you know, like Back to the Future. And all, it's just, it's like that. Yeah, it's, it's in like that, that same kind it's of in vein. that same tone, tonal place. To where it's kind of like a horror movie version of Back yeah, to the exactly. Future, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> sort of. You can go back and watch that movie, and it takes you into that time. And evidently, young people, the younger generations, still like it. You know, they, they, they like a lot of this '80s stuff, even the the new retro wave and stuff that's coming out, and all the to them it's retro. But they get it. The yeah. quality is there. You can watch these old movies and go, "Yeah, that was a badass story." Yeah. And yeah. this is definitely it's, one, it's that, one like that. that stands out and yeah. like stands the test of time. Like I said, yeah. I haven't seen the remake yet. If you've seen it, uh, tell me. I've heard it wasn't terrible. Like it got like pretty decent reviews. Yeah. And they also made a sequel to that, yeah. which uh, came out in 2013. But I think it went direct to video. So I haven't seen that either. Our, our AMC theaters doing reruns of 80s and 70s classics like Alien 1 yeah, we and saw Shining. Alien on the big and, screen, yeah. yeah, and they're putting up Ghostbusters. And they do it only... Those nights are packed. Yeah. And they're packed with, you know, Gen Z. Yeah. You know? So it's making a comeback. The the younger the younger audience understands this tone. It almost seems like the eighties never went away. Like it ne- it's yeah. You know what never I mean? It really went away. <laughs> the good things of the eighties kinda have survived. I mean there was a lot of shitty stuff in the eighties too, like But it's said. gone. But yeah, yeah, no one remembers it. It's That's gone. just kind of like yeah. what happens from every decade. Right. It's like there's always a bunch of shit that like nobody remembers. Yeah. But uh, the good shit from the '80s like is still yeah can live around. on. It, you know, like you just can't beat Indiana Jones one. Yeah. That movie will just always exist. It will always that that movie will stand the test of time. Yeah. You know. And same with Fright Night. I mean, and, yeah, this is and, easily easily and you know one of my favorite horror the back comedies. to the the Back to the Futures the. Uh, some of the Eddie Mur- Eddie Murphy movies, you know, Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah. One and two will always, to me, will always be great cop comedies. Yeah. You know, 80s. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have to say, too, that, like, speaking of Fright Night, I really, really, one of these days, I was going to do it this year, but I didn't think of it in time, I wanted to do the Vampire Amy Halloween costume, mm. if I can find a dress like that. But I need to do, like, a whole, like, cast that, in my face. Like, I looked it up, um, and because I was curious to see if anybody had done it. And I did find two uh, girls that had done it. One girl did it just with makeup, and that looks pretty cool. And one girl, like, went whole hog, and she, like, you know, made a made latex cast of her whole face. And, uh, you know, did that. And that looked pretty cool, too. 
Um, but it doesn't seem to be a very common Halloween costume. Yeah. I mean, as as well known as Fright Night is. And or at least partic- was. Yeah, and particularly yeah. if you Google Fright Night, I mean, that's one of the first pictures that comes up is Amy yeah. with that big fucking mouth with all the teeth sticking out of it. Yeah. So, you know, in that dress, like with the, like I said, it's kind of like a halter dress that looks sort of Marilyn Monroe-ish. So, I don't know, maybe I'll do that one of these days. Gotta get some yellow and red contact lenses and yeah. big old latex Easy bang to mouth. Do now. Yeah, I could probably do that yeah. pretty cheaply, honestly. But yeah, if you have not seen Fright Night from 1985, what the hell is the matter with you? You really, really need to see it because it's yeah. one of the best movies of the 80s, uh, you know, by any measure. Um, so you should definitely check it out. And then, you know, the the sequel's not bad either. And I've heard the remake's okay, but I haven't seen it yet, so I can't comment. <laughs> All right, so we will see you next time. Bye.